world tonight with you and with this group and with Ryan Hampton. Um, I'm going to invite, I'm going to thank MRC and Vinland and New Way for planning this and sponsoring it and making it happen. And I'm going to invite Jake up. Jake up, not Jacob. <laughs> Jake from New Way up. And he will in introduce Ryan, who's also coming up. Welcome. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I know, I feel handsome as Bob described them. Uh, guess that wasn't a good joke. <laughs> uh, my name is Jake Lewis. Uh, I'm the community relations manager here at New Way, and I'm absolutely thrilled to, to see everybody here tonight. I know there's a lot of places uh, everybody could be, and uh, just really grateful that you guys decided to join us tonight. Um, also want to give a special mention to, to Molly at Vinland and Wendy at uh, MRC. It's, it's uh, just a lot of gratitude to be able to work with wonderful programs within the Twin Cities and, and wonderful people, um, you know, supporting recovery, and it's just, it's just a, a wealth of, of recovery options in, in the Twin Cities area. So very grateful to be a small part of that. I um, also want to thank the Recovery Church for um, you know, hosting this, this beautiful space. Um, you know, Pastor Martha and Deanne and Bob, just really thank you for all the work that you guys did getting this together and getting it ready. A um, couple little notes quick and then we'll get started. Um, books are for sale afterwards and, and Ryan will be willing to sign some of the books as well. Um, his, his publisher, St. Martin's Press, actually donated uh, the books to Steve Rumler Foundation and they are selling them at cost for $12 and all that proceeds will go into programming and support for their program. So it's all going towards a really good cause. Um, we're gonna leave some time also uh, after the program for questions. So um, if you have some, Jessica will be walking around with a microphone and you'll get to talk into the microphone and ask questions. The reason we're all here tonight, absolutely thrilled to, to introduce Ryan. Um, he flew in from Los Angeles on Tuesday night, and you know, sure enough, in Minnesota, we got to give him a little taste of winter, so you know, I'm glad we could do that for you here. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it's just been, been great to get to know Ryan a little bit over the past couple days and thrilled that he could be here. So um, almost four years into recovery from a decade-long opioid addiction, Ryan Hampton has been rocketed to the center of America's rising recovery advocacy movement. Uh, he's a former White House staffer, and he's worked with multiple nonprofits and political campaigns. And he's now a prominent leading face and voice of addiction recovery and is changing the national dialogue about addiction. Uh, his content, his social media content, reaches over a million people a week. And Ryan is really breaking down culture barriers that have kept people suffering in silence and is inspiring a new generation of people recovering out loud through his Voices Project. He's also advocating for solutions and holding public policymakers accountable. Ryan was part of the core team that released the first ever Surgeon General's report on addiction in 2016 and was singled out by Forbes as a top social media entrepreneur in the recovery movement. Ryan connects a vast network of people who are passionate about ending the drug ep epidemic in America. Uh, he's been featured by USA Today, NPR, HLN, Vice, Forbes, Slate, Huffington Post, The Hill, uh, Wall Street Journal, and actually today taped an interview with MSNBC about the, the new CDC numbers that came out this morning. Um, so he's a busy guy. He's all over the place. Uh, on October 22nd, 2018, Ryan announced his Recovery Voices vote. It's an initiative he's leading to register and engage one million recovery-oriented voters by the 2020 election. In 2016, Ryan created the web series Facing Addiction Across America, and it documented his 30-day, 28-state, 8,000-mile cross-country trip visiting areas hardest hit by the addiction crisis. Now his book, American Fix, uh, was published by St. Martin's Press and was released in August of 2018. Without further ado. Ryan, if you could just give us a little bit of a background on how you got you know, addicted to heroin, how you got into recovery, and you kind of what your experience was you know, finding recovery the last time. Sure. First of all, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, great to be back in, in Minnesota. I've been able to spend uh, some time here in the Twin Cities in the past, uh, the past couple of months. Uh, it's also great to get some snow. I'm going back to Los Angeles and it's nice to see some snow before the holidays, before Christmas. Uh, it's important for me just to, to, to identify, introduce myself. My name is Ryan Hampton. Uh, I'm an author, an activist, uh, brother, son, friend, neighbor. Uh, I like writing. I love dogs. Uh, I've got a, I've got a, a, a six-year-old uh, pity back at home named Dollar, who I miss very, very much when I'm on the road. Uh, but you know, most importantly, 
uh, to, to identify I am a person in sustained recovery, which means I haven't felt it necessary to have a drink, a drug, or any other mind-altering substance since February 2nd, 2015. Uh, so I'm coming up on four years and, and a little bit less than two months. Thank you. You know, um, and, and it's crazy for me uh, to really, like literally crazy for me um, and blown away sometimes to sit there and like listen to that, that bio. Uh, four years ago, um, I, I was sitting in treatment like four years ago this week. Um, I had the evening before uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving evening, uh, I was on the streets of Los Angeles, uh, homeless, broke, uh, had been kicked out of my apartment, uh, was having a tremendous, tremendous, awful time trying to get help, uh, find treatment. Um, the doors just always seemed to be closed for me when I really wanted to get help and when it was time for me to get help. Uh, but it didn't start out that way. Um, I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Uh, I grew up with uh, pretty much a, I guess as close to a normal childhood as, as you could think. I did have some, have some trauma uh, in my younger ages. My father was in federal prison. My mom you know, took on multiple jobs to support the family. Um, there was just a lot of stuff, uh, you know, weird stuff that was going on in my household. Um, but all in all, you know, my parents loved me. I loved my parents. They did the best that they could uh, while I was growing up uh, through the struggles that we had as a, as a family unit. Um, I always had this interest in politics. I can't tell you where it came from. You know, I, I guess you could say it was my first addiction. It was like my first rush uh, was getting involved in politics. And I got involved at a really young age probably because it was my escape uh, you know, when I was in middle school and high school to get out of the household, get out of the house and just go do something else. Uh, and I found myself uh, volunteering for political campaigns and uh, you know, I was kind of an awkward kid in high school. Uh, did really well with grades though, played team sports. Um, and then when I graduated high school in 1999, uh, I moved to Washington DC and uh, started college. Uh, I had only been there about a week and I had gotten a job offer uh, to work uh, at the White House in um, President Clinton's administration and from 99 to 2001 um, served in the Clinton-Gore administration uh, directly working for Vice President Gore. And so needless to say, it's like, you know, things were kind of looking up for me, you know? <laughs> you know, I, I, I certainly didn't imagine that, that, you know, just a few short years later I would be uh, using heroin. I mean, it just was not in the cards for me, and nobody could have even imagined it. Nobody, nobody could, have, could have predicted that. Uh, I, uh, after, after the administration, um, I stayed in DC, um, worked for the DNC, was a political fundraiser working on the 2004 presidential campaign. Uh, it was a nice day outside in 2003. Uh, late in 2003, my roommate and I decided we were gonna take a hike. Uh, on the Billy Goat Trail, which is a, this just gorgeous trail uh, in between Virginia and Maryland. Very steep though. Uh, and I slipped, uh, fell, injured my knee, injured my ankle, uh, and found myself in the care of an urgent care center. Uh, you know, uh, to get it wrapped up, I was told I needed an MRI, uh, told that I needed to, to go get this thing checked out. Um, but in the meantime, <laughs> while I waited for the MRI, here's a prescription uh, for something to, to help you with the pain. Um, Look, I, I wish I knew then what I know now. Let, let's just put it that way. Um, the medication that they uh, prescribed me was hydromorphone, uh, many, many milligrams, I would say, uh, which is also known, known as Dilaudid. It's also known as morphine. Um, and that's what they gave me for, for, my, for my knee and for my ankle. Um, I did not get that MRI, uh, just to be absolutely clear. Um, but what I did get was another prescription and another prescription and another prescription and another prescription. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, you know, at, at, at a certain point, uh, I, I liked the feeling. It was taking away some stuff that had been going, in, uh, you know, going on inside of me for quite some time. Uh, but the real nexus, the real perfect storm of, of my addiction um, and where my opioid, addi opioid addiction took off was I, as I stated earlier, I'm from Miami, Florida. Um, I had decided to move back home. Uh, and moved back home to South Florida shortly after uh, the 2004 presidential campaign. Um, and if you know anything about the opioid crisis, if you know anything about uh, South Florida in the early 2000s to about 2008, 2009, uh, before we had an opioid crisis, we had a pill mill epidemic. Uh, we had a pain pill crisis. Uh, and it was the, the heart of it, uh, the center of the storm was in South Florida. 
you know, there were more uh, pain clinics, there were more pharmacies that only dis you know, dispersed uh, opioids, oxycotton, roxycodone, all those things, than there were 7-Elevens. That's not an exaggeration. Uh, where I lived in, in, on, the, on the county line of Broward and Dade County, within a mile of my home, there were seven pain clinics. Um, and and these, weren't, these weren't the most honest, legit pain clinics. Let's just be clear about that. Uh, these were places where you could walk in, as long as you had $200 cash, uh, you would get your prescription, no matter what your diagnosis was. Um, so as someone who had become dependent on opioids at the time, it was a great place to be. You know, uh, for me, I, uh, um, in, in, a, in a weird way, having the medication with my name on it and being validated by a doctor uh, kind of meant something to me and it allowed me to kind of cover it up for quite some time. The difference uh, where I really, you know, where things really took off is I started doing this thing called doctor shopping. I don't know if any of you know what that is, but it's where I wasn't getting enough pain meds from one doctor, I was running out of them, so I started hopping around to other doctors. Uh, during this time, things started getting really bad. Um, descent into full-blown addiction, you know, unemployable, uh, losing health insurance, family really starting to get fed up with me, had my first bouts with treatment that were completely unsuccessful. Um, you know, uh, staying in, in trap houses, which were, you know, undercover, you know, were, were, were billed as recovery homes or sober livings in South Florida, where everybody was just essentially getting high and using. Uh, and then I showed up to, to my last doctor's appointment, uh, which was in 2008. The state of Florida decided that they were going to fix this problem. Uh, the legislature decided, uh, you know, we've got the fix for this. We're, you know, there's way too many pain pills that are, that are going out there. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to uh, uh, start this thing called the PDMP, which is the Physician Drug Monitoring Database. This is not a knock against the current day PDMP, but I am going to take a knock at the PDMP back then um, because they really didn't know what they were doing. It was a new program. Uh, the, the, the purpose of this was to track everybody. It was to know uh, who was going to what doctor, what prescriptions you were getting, and everybody could have access to it. Well, on, on the surface, that sounds great because you'd be able to look at it and realize somebody needs help, <laughs> you know, and, and, and send them somewhere where they can get some help. Um, but that was not the case in, in, in my particular story. Uh, I showed up to my doctor's office uh, for the last time, uh, clearly was, was going through symptoms of withdrawal, um, needed my medication, um, had, you know, track marks and, and, you know, hadn't taken a shower probably in days. Uh, doctor took the $200 first. Uh, and then uh, opened up the PDMP and just started going down the list and said, you've seen this doctor and this doctor and here's the medications you have. You filthy, junky drug seeker. If you show back up at my office again, I'm gonna have you arrested. Um, well, at that point, I, I didn't really care about that. I just needed my meds. I needed to get well, you know? I, I was way beyond the, the point of like, Okay, you're not going to give me my meds. I'm going to get, let's, you know, let's ship me off to rehab. Where do I go? I didn't really know much about rehab. I certainly didn't know about recovery. Um, I walked right out that door, um, you know, and from, from someone who was working in, you know, the West Wing of the White House just a couple years prior, uh, you know, I, I had my first, um, I guess, dance with heroin that day. Um, very quickly went down that di downward spiral, just kept going, you know, further and further and further. Thank God I didn't die. You know, there were, there were so, many, so many times where just like a degree left or a degree right, I probably would have been dead. And this was before fentanyl hit the scenes. Um, fast forward, because I don't want to spend too much time on the, the train wreck story, but uh, I, you know, Thanksgiving Eve 2014, um, I had been trying to get treatment for quite some time. I, and my mom, you know, thank God for my mom. My mom, you know, she had, she had a hard line. It wasn't giving me, wasn't, wasn't loaning me money, uh, you know, wasn't paying for an apartment, wasn't having me stay with her, but she always picked up the phone. Uh, and when I, when I was there and I really needed help, uh, she was there to help me at that last time. Uh, I had tried to get into this public treatment center and I had no idea uh, how hard it was to get in. So I, I walk into this place say, listen, I need help. What, 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 what do I have to do to get in here? And uh, the, the clinician who was running it said, well, okay, that's great. We can get you some help. And, and um, you know, all you have to do is, you know, put your name in the back of this book. Opens up this binder. 
which was probably 30 or 40 pages thick. And I'm looking at it, and it was like single lined, you know, just chicken scratch over the whole thing. First name, last name, phone number. It just went down maybe 30 or 40 rows on each page. He's flipping it over and over and over. And he gets to the last page and gives me the pen and says, here's where you put your name, here's where you put your number. I said, great. Now what happens? He says, well, this is what happens. Every morning, uh, 8 a.m., uh, we open this binder and his beds become available. Uh, we start at the first person and we work our way down the list and we call. And if you don't answer your phone, we go to the next person. Um, some, something's just not right about that, you know, when, when somebody's looking for help. But I did, you know, eventually that number did get called. I did get that call. I did get into treatment. Um, the di and I know we'll discuss this later in the discussion. Uh, what really uh, changed for me and why it's become such a big banner issue of mine was recovery housing. Uh, when I got out of treatment, you know, nothing was really special about my treatment. I guess you could say it was more of a detox period for me, like a cool down period. I didn't go to some place where they had this great therapy and, and what was real deal treatment. It was just kind of a cool down period and nobody gave me a shot. I was that guy that they had pegged as like, he is not going to stay sober. There's no way that Ryan's going to get out of here and he's going to, you know, he'll be back or he's going to die. And those were the things I heard. Uh, but I had a peer community that I plugged into. Uh, I had a, a, a guy who picked me up the day I got discharged from, uh, from, from treatment. I'd never met him, didn't even know his name. Um, I, by luck and by circumstance, uh, he was the real deal. You know, the home that I ended up was the real deal. Um, I had no money. Uh, and uh, they were, you know, compassionate with that and, and let me stay there for a month while I, while I went to find a job so that I could pay my rent. Um, I went to meetings every single day, um, you know, and it saved my life, you know, and that, that I stayed in that home for two years, almost two years. Yeah. So what inspired you to get involved so quickly and, and, and get so loud about recovery? I certainly didn't plan to. <clears throat> Um, all I wanted to do was, was get better, um, you know, get back on with my life, maybe find a job and uh, get my family back and just, just simple things. That same recovery home, about seven months into to living there, uh, I escalated and I became what's called a you know, house manager, sober living manager, just somebody who had some extra responsibilities at the home, checking curfews, you know, being, being there to talk to the guys. Uh, uh, and it was, it was kind of like one of the first real responsibilities I had early on in recovery. And I took it kind of seriously, um, you know, and, and, you know, it was, it was you know, it, it, helped, it helped me as much as it helped them. Um, uh, there was a guy named Nick. Nick and I, uh, you know, went to the same treatment center. Uh, he got sober a little bit after, a little, you know, a few months after I did. Ended up moving into the same uh, center as me. We got kind of friendly and close, and Nick was my roommate. Um, we lived in these apartment style uh, living where there were two apartments and then two beds per room. Uh, I'm sorry, two rooms uh, in an apartment and two beds per room. Nick was in my room uh, at this time. So Nick comes home one night and he's like, Ryan, I gotta talk to you. You know, I'm using again. I've been using for some time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed. I, I don't know what to do. I can't stop using. Uh, I was like, okay, Nick, when's the last time you used? I, like 30 minutes ago. Um, all right, well, what do you wanna do? I want help. That's what he said. He said, I want help. I want to stop. I can't stop. I need detox. I'm like, well, what are our options here? Well, they were very limited. Nick didn't have insurance. Nick wasn't signed up for Medicaid. Nick's parents wouldn't talk to him. Nick's parents hadn't talked to him in like four months, even when he was in recovery. They were like, just get straight and well, then we'll talk to you afterwards. You know, we'll, we'll decide when you're better. Um, and, and, and he talked about that a lot. Um, the, the kid had two trash bags worth of, you know, that was all of his belongings. Uh, he was afraid he was gonna lose his job uh, since he had relapsed. But he gen I could see it, I knew. Like we spent two hours with, two hours with him that night. He really wanted help. Um, it was clear though from the, the, the people who owned the house that he couldn't stay there that night. I understand that, you know. Um, they thought he was in danger to the other residents. I get that, it was an abstinence-based house. Um, they said, you know, he can't stay here tonight. He's got to go somewhere else. Uh, let's get him some help. Let's get him detox. Let's, let's send him somewhere where he can get some help and bring him back in. Mind you, it was like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And the last 12 step meeting that happened in our area ended at 8, 30 PM. So that was kind of not an option that night, but there was a hospital. There was a hospital about a mile away from our house called Huntington hospital. 
beautiful hospital, massive campus. Like one of, it's known as like one of the better hospitals in Southern California. Uh, supposedly has this great substance abuse program. Um, and we said, okay, Nick, just here's an idea. You got a health problem, addicted to heroin, can't stop using. Go to the hospital, go to the ER room, tell them what's going on. Tell them you can't stop using heroin. Tell them whatever you have to tell them about your addiction to just get them to keep you there tonight. And uh, you know, call me in the morning. Let's like reevaluate this. Let's and, and let's just get you home. Let's get you home. Let's hit the reset button. Let's do what we do. Um, he agreed. He said, "Okay, that's that's a good idea. I'll go there." Um, about 11:30 at night, he walks the mile, goes to uh, the hospital, uh, checks in. Um, he goes to the ER room. You know. Per the records, he was in and out of there by you know two and a half, three hours, uh, most of that time sitting in a waiting room, um, and they discharged him. They discharged him with 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 nothing. They discharged him uh, with a piece of paper that said, you know, here's a bunch of 800 numbers uh, that you could call the next day and and try and find some 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 help. But other than that, you know, we're discharging you. We have no no room for you here. <clears throat> and the next morning. Um, you know, his parents came, came to our, our sober living. It was about 7.30 in the morning. We all got woken up and, uh, you know, Nick died. Nick died that night walking from the, uh, from the hospital back to the house. And he, he did use again, you know. He, he, he got out of that hospital with no help, um, used halfway through that trip, and, and he overdosed, died. They found him on the sidewalk. Um, and so when I got that story, you know, that was the first friend of mine who died while I was in recovery this time. And it really impacted me. But what really impacted me more was here was a young man who was basically begging for help. I mean, and he wanted help. Uh, he, he, he wanted to get better. Um, he had a medical problem. He went to a hospital, one of the best hospitals in Southern California. And they turned him away and he died. You know, and, and nothing about that situation sat right with me. There was just nothing about that that sat right with me. Me, my friends, our home, uh, the guys that, that were there, it just didn't seem right. And all of a sudden, all of these cliches, all these things that I had been told uh, by others about, you know, you know, some people have to die so other people can recover. You know, I remember that ringing through my head in early recovery. And like, I don't know about you, but like today, I'm almost four years sober. Um, nobody has to die so I can hold on to my recovery. And I know that's a fact. Um, you know, so that stuff really bothered me. Um, and at the same time, that I saw a film. It was on Netflix. And if you haven't seen it, I highly suggest it. I know a lot of people in here probably have seen it. It's called The Anonymous People. Uh, my friend Greg Williams, um, you know, he, he created it, directed it. He's a great recovery advocate. And I saw it for the first time, and it just, it, it, I was astonished by this film. Um, I saw people that were telling their recovery stories, going out into the community, um, being open about who they are, getting rid of that shame, getting rid of that stigma, and like all those societal barriers that have, that have kept people sick. Um, going out and, and, and looking at like, what better treatments could we be uh, you know, employing? How should we be, you know, we should be treating people uh, who have addiction um, and, and addiction problems as humans. You know, we should be, there's something that we should be doing different. Um, and that led me on this journey of, of advocacy and learning what's next and um, exploring around the country what other, what other cities and towns and communities were doing um, to end the crisis. <clears throat> and what I've found is every community is doing something a little bit differently, you know? Um, and a lot of people are doing it right, but they're not being heard. You know, we're seeing some incredible programs, some incredible, fascinating progress all around this country. Uh, one, you know, uh, for those of you that, that, that may have read the book or followed some of the work I've done, I've spent the last two years of my life literally in Dayton, Ohio, either, you know, working with the people down there or actually physically down there. I've made countless trips down there. Uh, first of all, because I heard it was the overdose capital of the nation, um, and I got a call. Uh, from somebody there, Lauren White, and she said, hey, I see you're doing this stuff, this thing called the Voices Project. I'm from Dayton. Uh, you know, the, this city, you know, we get, we get pegged as overdose capital of the nation, but there's something going on down here really special that you need to see. Like, this community is resilient. Um, come down here and meet these folks. So I go down there. This was about two years ago, and I'm telling this, I'm going a little off topic because it's, it's relevant to today's news. Uh, 
And um, I go down there and I see these peer, peer support programs that they've got. I'm seeing this program called Conversations for Change where they're uh, going into churches just like this. And you know, twice a month, they're offering free meals to drug users, uh, offering clothes, you know, uh, meeting them with some empathy, giving them some respect. But then when they're feeding them, they're bringing in resources for treatment. And I'm not talking like high-end private treatment. I'm talking about like, you know, don't have money type treatment, but we're going to get you help because we love you. That type of treatment. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the state had put, the, the governor had put a billion dollars of Medicaid expansion down there. But instead of, uh, you know, focusing on locking people up and solutions we, don't, we know don't work, peer recovery supports, um, things like that, conversations for change. A great organization called Families of Addicts, which has created a new support infrastructure for families uh, to recover with people who are struggling or for people who are in recovery, um, getting rid of some old modalities and thinkings that, that I think have been kind of ineffective or counterproductive. Um, and uh, harm reduction, syringe exchanges, uh, fentanyl testing strips. Fentanyl testing strips, when some others in the state and actually around the country have said, no, we don't want fentanyl testing strips because that's going to encourage use. That's going to that's going to let people, you know, test their fentanyl and see if, you know, people are going to want to get higher. They're going to use it like it's just just crazy thinking um, and naloxone, naloxone everywhere. So CDC releases their report today. You know, grim outlook for the country, they say 70,000 over 70,000 deaths last year due to drug overdoses. 45% uh, increase in fentanyl. That's massive, right? 20, about 26,000, 27,000 of that 70,000 number are fentanyl overdoses. Fentanyl is making its way into everything. But, <laughs> and I've been trying to get the media to pay attention to Dayton, Ohio for two years. People didn't want to go down and hear that story of resiliency, of innovation, of communities coming together. It was easier for them to go down there and tell that story, that train wreck story, and show those photos of people who are overdosing and show these big you know, makeshift morgues that are on the side of the street and think that this city is just, you know, it, it's, 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 it's done, that there's no hope there. Dayton, Ohio had a 53% decrease in overdoses last year. One of the only towns, one of the only cities in the country that didn't just plateau, but had a massive decrease. Why? Because the community came together and they decided to do something a little bit, it, it's common sense to us, but for, that, for, for, for them in Dayton, it was radical, it was disruptive. They took on the system, they tried something different. That's why we wrote the book. That's why I get into advocacy, because these communities, these stories, those need to be heard. And those are stories that need to be shared. Those are best practices. You know, Twin Cities could learn a lot from what's going on in Dayton, Ohio. I think every city in this country could learn from Dayton, Ohio. Um, so that, that's, those things are what inspire me and fuel me day to day. That's incredible. That decrease is huge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so going back a little bit, you mentioned anonymous people, um, you know, and obviously sharing uh, your recovery story within the recovery community is one thing. What was it like to share it you know, publicly uh, out there? Uh, did you get the reaction you thought you were going to? Were you scared, nervous? I was like absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was terrified too. <laughs> I, uh, so our family, you know, uh, we, we kept secrets really well, obviously as a family, uh, especially when I was in my addiction. My mom didn't want to talk about it. She, she was ashamed to ask for help. Um, she didn't want to even talk to other family members. Uh, and when I got into recovery, you know, I still felt that, that sense of shame and, and just like this huge burden of, you know, my, my true identity and who I was. Um, but, but I had had enough, you know. Um, I, I was having a hard time being heard uh, outside of my own small community. Um, I felt like I had something to say. And I had always liked writing. So I figured, hey, you know, this opioid crisis thing is making national headlines. I've got something to say. I want to tell my story, uh, not just for the purposes of telling my story. I wanted to tell people who I was, what happened to me, how hard it was for me to get into treatment, um, and how ridiculous that was. My friends are dying, and the way we're being treated is wrong, and something has to change right now. This was right before the, the 2016 national conventions. So, you know, naturally, as someone who had kind of grown up in politics and, and was still paying attention to what was going on politically, I thought maybe it would have an effect on how uh, policymakers saw it. That's, that's who I really geared it towards. 
we almost pulled um, the article the night before. You know, I had all these things going and going through my head. I had people I trusted and loved who said, yeah, absolutely, go do it. It's the right thing to do. And then I had people who I trusted and loved who said, absolutely not. You know, it is not the right thing to do. But I went ahead with it. Um, and hands down, the absolute best decision I've ever made in my life. You know, um, with saying that though, it, it is important to know that it was, for me, it was a highly personal decision. And for anybody who ever decides to do that, it is a really personal decision. And, and circumstances are different for everybody. You know, I, if there's one thing I've learned these last four years, it's that discrimination and prejudice are real <laughs> when it comes to, 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 our, to our folks. It, they are real. People can lose their jobs. <laughs> people can lose their homes. People are denied life insurance. People are denied health care. People are denied uh, promotions at work. Uh, you know, people can lose their kids. I mean, this stuff is real. Um, so not everybody has that luxury of being able to go out and, and just blurt their story out and, and publish an op-ed and, and you know, not suffer massive consequences. My um, story, though, was that we published it. People reached out to me that I haven't talked to in decades. Um, people I went to high school with, uh, family members, friends, um, and said, wow, this is you know, it's fantastic. How can I help? Or I have a problem too. What do I do? Or I'm in recovery also. Um, so it was quite the positive experience for me. You know, when it comes to like what we call this new recovery advocacy movement, it's you know, I, 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 as a gay man, like I have uh, taken a lot of time and studied the LGBT movement, right? And and I think it's important that there are a lot of similar verticals there. You know, uh, you know, healthcare people, you know, an issue that's just you know had been shrouded in shame and stigma, um, you know, moral failings, all that stuff, and then people coming out of the closet and starting to identify as being. Uh, LGBT, uh, creating that constituency uh, of consequence. When that phenomenon started in the 80s, uh, not <laughs> every gay man in America or gay woman in America came out of the closet and said, "Hey, I'm you know I'm here and I'm gay," and you know uh, you know took to the streets and, and got active. But a few did, you know, and the ones that did, you know, were able to speak for the ones who couldn't, you know. And, and I think it's important that anybody who has that opportunity to share their story or has that opportunity to make that impact, uh, that they do get involved. You know, you can s start small. You know, tell a family member, tell a loved one, tell an employer. Um, but, but we do it for the folks who can't do it right now. Uh, and, and that is very, very real. So you, you published the, the op-ed and, um, you know, You've been talking about what's next, and, and how do you get to then deciding to write American Fix? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that, and then if you could discuss too some of the uh, people you talk about in the book. Um, so American Fix, uh, I, I, I did not set out to write a book <laughs> um, in the beginning. Um, the book was the outcome of just kind of the, la the last four years. Uh, 2016, my best friend and I decided to, to uh, take you know, I tell my story, we ask what's next. I said, well, obviously what's next is we're gonna travel the country. <laughs> we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go everywhere we can and we're gonna learn and we're gonna see what's happening. Um, so that's what we did. You know, we raised a little bit of money from our community, uh, got the blessing from, from friends of ours and, and, and some folks that we really trusted in the advocacy movement, got their support um, and rented an RV, uh, traveled uh, tw across 22 states in 30 days, logged over 8,000 miles. Um, and we went to every single place that we could. Um, we didn't really need hotels to stay in because we stayed with, uh, at homes of people who were in recovery or we stayed at homes of people who had lost a child or a loved one uh, so that we could talk to them and learn from them. Um, we went into jails and, and prisons. Uh, we went into treatment centers. We went into recovery centers. We went into churches. We met with doctors. Um, I, I just wanted to learn everything that I could uh, about what was going on. Uh, it was well documented, Addiction Across America, which is a web series we did. So about 18 months ago, uh, I, 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 I'm on this journey of like, I want to learn more, I want to I read more, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just like a sponge for information about the addiction crisis and also recovery. So I go to Romans in Pasadena, which is a pretty fairly large chain of bookstores, and I go into the social justice section, I go into the... Um, uh, criminal justice section, I go into the biography section, excuse me, 
and I'm looking for a book written by somebody who had been through addiction, uh, who was now in recovery, um, and I wanted to hear a recovery story. You know, I wanted to hear an inspiring recovery story that would like lift me up. I also wanted to hear about uh, how they found recovery. I wanted to hear about some of the other stuff, maybe some solutions and, and whatnot. Um, but all I could find, and this is a true story, and I've read, read a lot of addiction books, were these books by a lot by people who I you know grew up idolizing and looking up to, and a lot of celebrities and maybe some journalists here and there. Um, and it was like, you know, 18 chapters on like the train wreck, you know, and like the last four pages of the 19th chapter was like, oh yeah, and then I got into treatment and I got my family back and life's great, you know, good luck. And uh, it, you know, it was just, that's not what I wanted to read. Didn't buy a book that day, came home, uh, and I was talking, my best friend's name is uh, uh, Garrett. Uh, Garrett and I were talking that, that night when I came home and he's like, you know, what about the trip? He's like, we saw, we met so many incredible people on that trip. Um, and, and, and there's this story to be told, like, why don't you, you know, you're so angry you couldn't find a book you wanted to read, why don't you write the book you want to read? And I said, that's a crazy idea, but let's do it. <laughs> You know, and, and that night I sat at my computer and I just took, you know, rewatched the series and went through the notes from our trip and just start jotting down notes. Um, and uh, about midnight that night I jumped onto Google and I said, I asked Google, you know, how do you, how do you sell a book? <laughs> you know, and then I asked Siri, you know, how do you, how do you write a book? You know, and um, they had some good advice. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, I, it said, you, you know, you need an agent, you need, you know, there's a bunch of big publishers out there, uh, don't write the manuscript, you know, write a proposal, write one chapter that kind of gives the person a writing sample. And so that's what I did. Uh, and and I, it took me about two weeks to do it. And I hit send. I sent it to all the big publishers. I sent it to info at, you know, whatever address was given. No one specific. I didn't know anybody there. Sent it to a lot of small houses too. And uh, if there's one thing recovery's taught me, it's that, okay, take action, stay out of the result. Stay out of the result, Ryan, because you'll get into that headspace. And it was, and, and I did, I stayed out of the result. Um, one week went by, nothing. Second week went by, nothing. Phone's not ringing, no emails. I get into that, you know, 2.5 to three week zone, and my email starts blowing up. I start getting calls from publishers. Um, and, and they all, all five big ones came back and they said, look, this is, this is a story we, we, we haven't seen before. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of addiction books out there, but we really haven't, you know, we, we haven't seen something that's told from this perspective uh, with, with a unique view of someone who's, you know, recently in recovery, who spent a lot of time traveling the country, who wants to write about other people and these great things that they're doing and focus on the solution um, and kind of give an agenda. Uh, and I was like, okay, you know, that's great. You know, let, let, let's talk turkey. And uh, four of the publishers uh, came back, and I tell this story because it's, it's important to know how the, how the media kind of manipulates our stories. Four of the really, really big ones came back, all four. Um, and they said, uh, this is great. Um, we'd love to publish this story. Um, but we need to change a little bit. <laughs> you know, uh, we need to give you a writer, we need to give you an editor, uh, we wanna work with you every single page. Like, you literally don't go to page two without sending us the page, you don't go to page three without sending us the page. Uh, and, and we need to hear a little more grit. You know, we need to hear a little bit more about the, you know, the doing drugs in the White House bathroom, and we wanna hear a little bit more about the hustle and all this stuff. And it, that's, that, you know, that's not our MO, right? Uh, we hear plenty of those stories. Um, I, I think that that's actually part of the reason that, that a lot of people out there uh, stigmatize us. I think it's the reason that it's harder for people to come out of the shadows and ask for help. Uh, you know, I think it's part of the reason that uh, a vast majority of America still doesn't believe that we get better. You know, I mean, like, we get well, we get better. Uh, families get better, and, and the faces and the voices that need to be heard more of uh, are those of recovery and recovery stories. Um, but the fifth one came back, and it was St. Martin's Press, uh, the, the editor there, who, who I'll be forever grateful. Um, it's you know, important to note I'm a, I'm a liberal Democrat. You know, I'm, I grew up in a Democrat home and worked for Bill Clinton, and I get a call from Adam Bellow. So just, you know, I don't expect anybody to know who Adam Bellow is, but Adam Bellow 
is uh, the editor who acquired Dinesh D'Souza. He acquired Sarah Palin's book. He's known as one of the most conservative book publishers in the country. Uh, and he started this imprint at St. Martin's Press called All Points, which was trying to get all points of view. And he said, look, I got this manuscript here. He's like, I, or, or your proposal here. He's like, I think it's great. I was like, okay, well, like, what's the process? You know, what's the gig? You, you, you have somebody that's going to write it for me too? And uh, he said, no. He's like, we, uh, I think it's an important story needs to be told. Um, and uh, you got eight months, you know? You got eight months, go, write, go write, write your heart out. Come back to me in eight months, bring me a manuscript, and let's publish a book. And uh, that's what I did. Um, and and the, the end product is American Fix. Um, the, the only editing in that book was grammatical, which is great. They didn't change the narrative. They didn't even suggest changing the narrative. But I want to note that Adam, uh, Adam had a family member uh, who was currently struggling with addiction at the time he acquired the book. His daughter is a New York social worker dealing with substance use disorder. She sees it every single day. And Kevin Riley, who was his assistant, who actually got the book and put it in front of Adam, had just lost his brother to an overdose six weeks prior. So, you know, it, it, it was kind of like a, it was meant to be type moment. Um, the folks that I wrote about in the book, these were all stories of people that I had met. Uh, these were all stories of people who had inspired me, uh, mentored me. Uh, the people doing incredible things all around the country. I, I write about Dayton a lot in the book. I write some of those, those folks that you see in the New York Times today that they're talking about is just like these innovative game changers. Well, I mean, they've been around for quite some time, uh, and we've been trying to get them to pay attention to them for quite some time, and I'm glad they're getting their due right now. Um, the most impactful uh, visit during that trip was uh, one of the last ones that we made. And, and I, I, wrote, I, I wrote a lot about it in the book. And uh, uh, a lot of the guys that went to this program and are in this program are some of my best friends today. So we're traveling through Texas, you know, through the South, and uh, I get this call. You know, we were actually, our end goal was to get to the Democratic National Convention and like get there and share all this information we had learned and try and influence policy leaders. So I was on like this, you know, you know, Hillary train or whatever, and you know, Democrats and all this great stuff, you know, true blue Democrat, excited the presidential elections coming up. And I get this call from um, Sheriff Carl Leonard, who uh, is the Republican elected sheriff of Chesterfield County, Virginia, incredibly rural county uh, in, in, in Virginia, um, a, a very red county also, I, I might mention. Um, and he's like, hey, I hear you're traveling the country, you're doing this web series, you know, I opened up this program here, I started this program here two years ago, I'm not two years ago, two weeks ago, uh, and, and I'd love you to come and check it out, it's something different, we're, 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 we're trying something different, why don't you come in here and, and see what we're up to. I said, okay, great, you know, uh, make my way into Virginia, get there and I walk into Carl's office, and, uh, you know, he's like six foot tall, you know, 280 pounds, you know, military buzz cut, and you know, here I am in my Warby Parker glasses, you know, liberal from you know Los Angeles that people like that usually would like eat for lunch, and he and there's pictures on the wall of like him with Donald Trump and Mike Pence, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Where am I? And, and I sit down, and um, he goes, he goes, I want to tell you something. He goes, you know, we've been arresting people. Uh, for heroin use and for addiction use for decades. He goes, and it's, it just doesn't work. He goes, it's not working. He goes, I, 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 he goes, I see people come into my jail. Um, and one of, you know, they come in, we get them sober. You know, they're only sober because they're, they're locked out from the drugs or the alcohol or whatever it is. They sober up in jail. We keep them for however long their sentence is. Uh, and then we send them right back out into the community where they came from, and one of two things happens. Either they come back and catch another charge that's going to get them more time or put them in the state or fed pen. He goes, oh, they end up dead. Uh, and he says, we got to do something different. He says, something has to change. And he's like, I, I didn't know what to do, but there's this great uh, nonprofit, you know, a couple miles down. Some of you may have heard it, the McShin Foundation, John Schinholzer's um, nonprofit in Virginia. And, and they're doing something different. And so he, he gets on the phone with John Schinholzer and says, hey, we, we want to do something different here at the jail. Why don't you come down and check it out? Within 48 hours, they had a program set up uh, in, in this jail. And it was called the, uh, originally it was called the Heart Pro, it's still called the Heart Program, but that stood 
stood for Heroin Addiction Recovery Program. Now it stands for the Helping Addicts Recover Program because it's encompassing of, of all substances, including meth, alcohol, cocaine, uh, you know, anything. Anybody can come in there and seek help. First thing he did is he said, uh, we're going we're gonna to take this tank. Uh, the tank was probably about half the size of this room, uh, three stories high, you know, cells all around the place. He said, we're going to take this tank, we're going to empty it out of everybody, and when somebody comes into the jail or somebody who's, who's here at the jail uh, that says they have a problem with addiction uh, and they want some help, they want to try a different way, we're going to put them in that tank. We're going to put everybody in the tank that wants recovery. We're going to put them together. They're going to sleep together. They're going to eat together. They're going to live in the same area. He wanted to create that sense of community. Uh, and then he said, we're, we're also going to bring in 12 hours of, of supports every day. Uh, we're going to be, bring in peer recovery specialists who are volunteers from the community. We're going to bring in 12-step meetings. We're going to bring in other pathways when they're available. Uh, he got county clinicians to come in. Um, he had mental health therapists come in. He had folks come in who could, who could evaluate folks if they needed to be on certain prescriptions for mental health or substance use. Um, and there was a little bit of buzz that was starting. Um, the, the men that were in this program, uh, they have subsequently started a women's program too, but at the time when I was there, it was only a, ma a, ma a male program. Uh, they started to get a little bit of hope back, you know, that they might be able to, 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 to do this thing called recovery. There was a problem though. Um, he was releasing them back out into the community and there were no services. And uh, it got to a point where uh, inmates, uh, uh, participants, and, and I catch myself saying that. So, so Carl, one of the big things with Carl is he says, uh, uh, we're not going to call people inmates uh, in this jail. We're going to call them participants because uh, they're people. And we're going to give them the dignity, the dignity that does belong to them. Um, he said, we've got this problem, and, and, and uh, these participants are going back out, and, and, and they're actually telling their parole officers they don't want to leave. You know, they want to stay in jail. They, they, they want to stay here at the Chesterfield Jail because they feel safe and they're getting services. Uh, so he said, okay, I, I have an idea. Uh, there's no rules against this. We're going to open the jail up. So when people leave, uh, they can come back. They can come back during the daytime. They can participate in the day program. If they feel unsafe at any time during the day, 24 hours a day, he's instructed uh, the dispatchers and the deputies, if someone calls 911 and says, I need help, I'm, I, I, you know, I think I'm going to use or I'm in a dangerous situation or vulnerable situation, those deputies are instructed to go pick that person up and bring them right back to the jail, right back into the program, not arrest them. Um, and, and, and get them the help they need. So, you know, and again, this is come, all of this progress and, and this way of thinking is coming from a, a guy who, you know, and I had biases when I went in because he was a Republican. I mean, how stupid of me, right? Uh, and uh, that wasn't enough, though. He, he identified they had housing issues, you know, um, and one of the reasons I'm so big on recovery housing, uh, they, they needed a place, a safe place to stay. Uh, so he took some money out of his own budget uh, and invested in getting some recovery homes. He, he spoke to the McShin Foundation and other partners, and he said, hey, how about you guys open these recovery homes and, and we'll pay the rent uh, until these, these guys get jobs. So when that happened, he also realized, oh my gosh, they're having a problem getting a job in the state of Virginia. You know, people, we know that recovery outcomes are, are, are higher when people have housing, when they have employment, when they have a sense of purpose, when they've got, you know, uh, the, the, the recovery supports that they need. So he said, I have an idea. <laughs> uh, we're going to bring the peer recovery specialist training into the jail. And uh, after folks are here, participants are here for, for a period of time, we're going to allow them to be trained. Uh, to become peer recovery support specialists. I'm going to give them passes to leave for the day uh, to go work with other peers and, and learn, learn, learn how to become uh, support specialists so they can make some money when they get out of, out of the program. And uh, all this time, now this, is, this has been two years. This has been an evolution that's been going on for two years. Uh, just like Dayton, I mean, it was like banging my head up against a wall trying to get people to look at Chesterfield County, Virginia. You know, uh, governor didn't, well, the governor at the time didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, we had, we had uh, trouble trying to get county commissioners to pay attention to it. Uh, I wrote about it in the Huffington Post. Uh, we, we did some creative stuff to try and get eyeballs on it. We went in there and we did some Facebook Lives that, like, you know, we did a Facebook Live while we were in the jail uh, with the participants. And uh, it went viral and people started asking questions. All this time, though, he couldn't get any funding. 
uh, state wouldn't give him funding, county wouldn't give him funding, municipal government wouldn't give him funding, federal government wouldn't give him funding. Um, and the, the cost of it, which is just astonishing, was only $2,500 a month uh, for 40 people. So he was able to provide these services for $2,500 a month for 40 people. Double that with the women, it was about $5,000. Now many of you know what it costs to incarcerate somebody. We're looking on average at the low end from $30,000 to $70,000. Uh, you know, so it was a huge savings, not, not, not just helping people, but it was a savings to the community. Uh, University of Virginia uh, just recently um, completed, this was post book, um, completed their first kind of study on this jail. Um, it did start getting some attention. Um, and it's showing a, a drop, a reduction, I'm sorry, of 87% in recidivism which are numbers that just are kind of unheard of, an 87% reduction in recidivism. What he's doing is working. Um, it, it is a model for the country. Um, and again, it's, 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 it's why you know, I do what I do. It's why I wrote that book. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the most fascinating stories of my lifetime. Uh, you know, Carl Leonard's become a good friend. Um, I, I get calls still to this day from other sheriffs who are like, how do we get in touch with this guy, Carl Leonard? You know, I read him, in, I read about him in your book. There were, you know, it's been one of the best parts of the book because I'm getting calls from DAs in Chicago wanting to know how they can connect with this guy and, 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 and set up that program in, in their city, in their town. Um, that's why we did it. Um, and, and, and that's been, you know, the most gratifying experience so far of the journey. That's an incredible story. Um, a couple more questions, and I think we can open it up to other questions. But one of the things I definitely want to touch on, and, and you've mentioned it tonight, and then you've also talked a lot about it in the book, is the recovery residence component of things. Yep. You know, um, why, why is that so important to you? Uh, and, and why did you kind of choose that as your banner to, to talk about? So um, as I said earlier, like beyond just my own lived experience, um, you know, we have a big gap in recovery housing, not just in recovery housing, but we have this massive treatment gap in the country. Um, the treatment gap is still, even though the, the NISDA, you know, study showed that um, there's about a, you know, a 0.2% shift in the treatment gap, I think, as of the, you know, this year, and they're celebrating it. Uh, it's still, in my mind, uh, you know, 90%. You know, 90% of people who need help uh, will never, you know, see treatment. Uh, one out of 10 people will actually be able to get into treatment. Uh, barriers exist, whether it's insurance or, you know, uh, money or, uh, you know, geography. A lot of places there aren't treatment centers. Uh, all that exists. And, and, and I see a real viable pathway uh, to getting people help, people who don't necessarily have uh, the resources to go to treatment. Uh, if they can get some sort of detox, hopefully covered under some sort of Medicaid provision and Medicaid expansion dollars, just like uh, um, Ohio is doing, um, but then get them into a stable home. You know, get them into a stable home, a safe home, a qualified home, you know, somewhere where there's peers there that, that, that can help them, lift them up. That was my experience, you know. Um, I would have saved a lot of money. Uh, my family would have saved a lot of money, you know, early on during my addiction. Um, had I even known about what recovery housing was all about? Had I known how to go out and find a qualified one? Um, so while I advocate that we need more access to affordable uh, recovery homes and we need more capacity for it, I also recognize, because I've been through them um, and I've seen them, uh, that we have a big problem um, with recovery homes too. You know, there's a lot of uh, operators out there who are taking advantage of uh, our community, ripping off our families. Um, uh, you know, they're not ethical places. Uh, we, we don't really have a golden standard for, for what a recovery home should look like or, or didn't have one up until recently. Um, took on this banner issue mostly in the last year and a half. Last July, I'm gonna tell one more quick story if that's all right. Um, Last July, uh, I, I lost my first sponsee, a young guy I was working with. He was an alumni of the treatment center I was in. His name was Tyler. Um, Tyler was young in his early 20s. And uh, he went into what, was, what we thought you know, on the surface, what the community thought was like a, you know, one of these better recovery homes, one of these better sober livings. It was, it was in Pasadena. It was pretty expensive. His parents were, I think, doling out somewhere like $1,500 a month for him to live there, which is just ridiculous. Um, and uh, he, you know, he, he, he was uh, trying to seek recovery from, from heroin. You know, he was very vulnerable. About 90% of that house, um, and it was a larger house, 16 uh, men and women, it was co-ed, uh, were, were, you know, in early recovery from some sort of opioid, uh, whether it was, you know, heroin or pills. 
Uh, Tyler had a recurrence of use. He called me that night. He told me what was going on. He said the house was going to let him stay. I said, all right, man, you know, uh, great. They're, you know, you're in a safe spot. Um, call me tomorrow. I'll pick you up. We'll go to a recovery meeting. You know, we'll, let's just take it from there. And uh, he, he, what happened was uh, he came home that night. He was using, he told the, the house manager, and, and actually it was the house owner. Uh, she said, all right, you know, we will let you stay. Um, just go downstairs, go to the couch and, and sleep it off. And uh, we'll talk about it in the morning. Now, anybody who knows anything about overdose response or has any training in it, when somebody's in that, like, you know, like they're, they're, they're really under the influence of, of, of opioids, one of the last things you do is you tell them to go to sleep. You know, um, she comes down to check on him the next morning, and uh, he was blue, and you know he was he was overdosing, and he was having that rattle, and um, there, she was panicking, um, and uh, there was no naloxone. Uh, she didn't know how to respond to an overdose. Now this was a house that had been there for like 10, 12 years, been operating. Uh, didn't know how to respond to an overdose. Called 911. Uh, it took about four minutes for 911, the EMTs, to get to the house. Uh, in between her finding him and that four minutes for, for, for them to get there, he died. Uh, he was, he was uh, DOA when, when the EMT got there. And um, I get this news and, and, and I'm distraught and I'm upset that, that Tyler's passed away and um, you know, I'm not, not really processing it that much. And, and uh, I go to see the, the house manager the next day or the house owner the next day and I'm like, what, what was going on? You know, um, why is it that, you know, you know he was paying so much money. Why? Why wasn't there naloxone on site? Why did not anybody know how to deal with a, you know, respond to an overdose? You've got like 90% of your people living at this house who are in recovery from opioids. Um, I think of it like this: like, uh, would we send? Would you send? Would I send a loved one who has diabetes, <laughs> extreme case of diabetes, uh, to an assisted living facility that refused to carry insulin? No, I mean, it makes no sense, right? Um, so when I, I start drawing these comparisons to her, she puts her hand on my shoulder and she goes like, you know what, Ryan, the, the, you know, I'm sorry you feel this way, I'm sorry you're so upset, but the real, the real sad story here is that um, you know, Tyler just, he just didn't want to get sober enough. He didn't want recovery enough, and, and that's what's sad about this. Once again, I mean, I could have blown a gasket at that moment, um, but I didn't. You know, I looked at her and I said, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way, you're wrong. Uh, but I really had no recourse. My family didn't have much recourse at that point because there are no requirements that naloxone be on hand. There are no standards for recovery houses. Um, you know, I can't imagine how many Tylers there are uh, all across this country. So I once again went back to what I knew, you know, which is I put my head down, I said, all right, we're gonna change this. You know, and how did we do that? Uh, two younger people who were friends with Tyler, uh, you know, 25, 26 years old, friend of, friends of mine and I, uh, went to our congresswoman's office, uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu from Southern California, uh, pretty much demanded a meeting with her. Uh, we eventually got her attention. She sat with us and I told her Tyler's story. And I told her this was happening just a couple blocks away from where her district office was. And she was just astonished. I mean, you know, one of the more fascinating things is like how little our public policy leaders actually know about what's really going on in their communities. And she was astonished. And, and she said, well, why don't we write some legislation? Why don't you work with us on some legislation to try and change that? Uh, so we spent several months writing what was uh, HR House Resolution 4684, uh, which for the first time um, set standards in recovery houses. It was also known as the Access to Quality Sober Living Act. And uh, within Congress, it was known as Tyler's Law. Um, and it, it published, for the first time, it publishes standards for recovery homes. SAMHSA is now, uh, as of January 1, publishing these standards. Uh, one of the standards recommendations is that naloxone is carried, uh, is, is stocked, and that people are trained on overdose response trainings. Um, the federal government wasn't able to actually mandate it, but what they were able to do was open up a, a, a really big pool of money um, that would offer technical assistance to all 50 states so that those states could put in some regulatory controls over these things and, and nudge this in the right direction. Um, and we're starting to see some state legislators take, take that up. Pass the House uh, of Representatives unanimously, um, pass the Senate uh, with one vote against it, 
from Mike Lee in Utah. It was part of the opioids package, and President Trump signed it into law uh, a couple weeks ago. So um, Tyler's not, law is now the law of the land. I tell that. I only tell that story though. Um, I only tell that story though because it, it, it's just an example. You know, again, it's why I wrote the book. You know, it, it's a prescription for every community in this country. It's a prescription for people in recovery and family members. Um, if you identify and you see a problem in your community and you're not okay with it, 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 at this point right now, it's really up to us to step up and be vocal uh, and make that known. You know, uh, people with lived experience, people who have gone through this, people who have seen it with their own, with their own eyes and lived it, um, we sometimes have better solutions than the doctors and the scientists and the, and the, and the data people and the researchers. Um, and it's important that we've got those, those voices at the table. One last quick question, and then we can open up to, to questions from the audience. But um, you know, so you, you mentioned at the very beginning that four years ago today you were, you know, in, you know, in treatment. You know, thinking where you were then and where you are now, did, was this even a possibility? And then, what advice might you have for for somebody here that's early in recovery or dealing with a family member that's early in recovery? Um, mm -hmm. What advice might you have? So. Uh, Part, first part of your question, uh, no, <laughs> absolutely unequivocally, no, wouldn't have seen myself here four years ago. Um, at this point, I, this actual very moment four years ago, I didn't even think I was going to live. Um, and, and neither did the people closest to me. So uh, recovery is possible, recovery works, it's, it's, it's really powerful. Um, the advice I'd have for, for family members, uh, loved ones, um, uh, by the way, how many people in this room love someone in recovery? That's great. How many, how many people are, are in recovery? That's great. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, family members, um, don't give up. You know, be there for your loved ones. Um, you know, there's hope as long as, as long as there's breath, as long as someone is breathing, uh, there is hope. Uh, my mother, um, you know, was the only person, the, the only person on the planet Earth uh, who believed that her son could overcome uh, that addiction. Uh, she was the only one that, that thought I had a chance at survival. Um, and she told me that. You know, even, you know, I had done some terrible things. I was awful to my family when I was in, in, in the depths of my use, and, and we know what that looks like. Um, but she consistently told me how she loved me. You know, um, my mom had some, had some real, you know, good, healthy boundaries, I think, while I was using. But we always had a Friday, I actually don't tell this story in the book, we had a Friday um, kind of dinner date uh, that was always standing while I was on the street and while I was using, and it was, uh, you know, Ryan, I just want to see you, I want to buy you a meal, uh, you know, show up and we can have some conversation, and, and, you know, it was her attempt at, like, trying to push me to get some help. Uh, so don't, don't give up on your loved ones, um, most importantly. And uh, if, you're, if you're in recovery, you know, um, be your most authentic self, you know. Uh, as soon as I was able to, to, to be myself, be who, really, be who I really was, find my voice, you know, not be influenced by all the chatter in my head and influenced, more importantly, by what other people thought I should be thinking, and I was able to, to find my voice and, and think on my own, and um, my recovery kind of took off. You know? I, I found my tribe. I found people that I trusted. Um, I wasn't afraid um, to do different things in recovery. And, and I found purpose, you know, chase that purpose, grab a hold of it, um, you know, and, and be of service. Definitely be of service to others. That, that's probably the most important thing you can do. Well, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited, you know, that you're here and I'm excited to see what comes next. Thank you. And speaking of what's next, I think there's ways to stay in touch with you in the back of the book. There's you know, yep. Facebook and Twitter and all social media and yep. ryanhampson.org. So um, stay tuned on that and questions. And please get in touch with me. I, I respond to everything. You guys want to get connected. You know, I know folks are here from the, the Rumler Hope Network, a uh, great advocacy organization that I've uh, come to absolutely adore. Um, get involved with them, too. They're doing some great work, and, and we partner on a lot of things. Hi. Hi. Appreciate your talk, Ryan. Thank you. Really interesting to hear. I'm Jeff Sawyer. I'm an addiction psychiatrist in town. Hey, Jeff. And uh, one of the things you said right at the end sort of caught my attention, linked into what you said before, which is that as long as people are still breathing, there's hope, right? right. Yeah. So I hope one of the things you included in your bill was naloxone is not the only thing to help. That's correct. CPR, very important. Yep. And had that woman known it, she yep. could have Rescue managed the situation yep. until they got there. 
You know, I think the other things that you talked about really point to access and how we define treatment. Mm -hmm. And treatment has been defined very narrowly. Mm -hmm. Residential, inpatient, detox, can't get access to that, no treatment. Yep. So that sheriff did creative things in terms of creating access, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking to do that in town here as well and looking at, well, what are the access points? Where are the people at? Because mm -hmm. many of these people don't show up in treatment or they don't know how to get there or they yep. can't get access yep. or the waiting list is too long or yep. what have you. So emergency rooms on the street in public settings. So we've mm -hmm. put together a, a collaboration of organizations looking to provide low threshold access in those areas. In emergency rooms, getting emergency physicians engaged in and interested in they're part, part of that legislation, um, there's, there's some grant money available right now that, that the city and state should look into. There's a pilot program that's actually going to open up uh, MAP, buprenorphine, and, and methadone treatment in the ER rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be available on demand. Right. And that's the goal. Yep. And so it's about really educating, supporting, training mm -hmm. emergency room physicians, yep. primary care physicians, meeting people in public spaces, on the street, providing access. And treatment can look like many different things. It can look like on-the-spot treatment, engagement, mm -hmm. medication if needed or interested, whatever approach, but connecting to resources from there. Because you're right, mm -hmm. people don't know how to access treatment. When you don't know, you're stuck. And if primary care physicians are more engaged and interested, you know, there are many well, places you could show up then. The, the real, also the, the, real, like, the real enemy here too, though, when, when we talk about treatment uh, and, and, and what angers me, uh, is the cost of treatment, you know, uh, and that's, I believe that that's, you know, one of the highest barriers. There's no reason that the cost is so high for treatment. For right, and again, disorder. but that's treatment as we've defined treatment in the past. Right, correct. Mean, if you could go to your primary care doctor and yep. have treatment, mm -hmm. or in the emergency room and have treatment, all through insurance, all paid, yep. just the way anything else is paid, because again, you pointed to, you know, your friend shows up in the emergency room, mm -hmm. given a list of 800 numbers to call. Mm -hmm. Addiction is the only illness that we mm -hmm. would ever do that for. That's right. You showed up in the emergency room with chest pain. Mm -hmm. You're Maybe admitted. potentially having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Needed an angioplasty. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't hand you a list of 800 numbers and say, here, go call them tomorrow. Right? Mm -hmm. Malpractice. Yep. But with addiction, eh. Well, because we're, we're seen as disposable. <laughs> right. Yeah, by exactly. A lot of ER, by actually a lot of uh, ER physicians. I mean, there's, there's, there's a term, I can't think of what it is, but they, they use it, uh, you know, in some of the hospitals in California, and it's, it's, it's awful. Well, interestingly yeah. enough, I've talked to a large conglomeration, of, a mm -hmm. private ER group that mm -hmm. staffs a number of hospitals in the area, and they've got a core group of people who are interested and passionate about this, which yep. is good. So Absolutely. That's where it starts. So I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. And yep. uh, hopefully we can build on that. Uh, if, if one more thing, um, you, you talk about access, and I don't think I got to talk. I, I'm not going to bring it up too much. But one more, I think, critical access uh, point uh, is, is the actual user. And I think we're seeing some really interesting data with overdose prevention sites uh, and, and um, you know, safe consumption sites. Uh, as being, you know, a touch point for recovery, uh, and we, you know, we're seeing 37% more likely chance that people will ask for help and, and get treatment when they when they come through that. And the problem is, I mean, if you write about what's happened in Denver, the Denver City Council yep. just yep. the other day, that's right. And you've got a passionate lawmaker there mm -hmm. who says we're enabling people, right? And you know, why would we want to give them the very mm -hmm. that they're, you know, addicted to? You know, so it's run by thoughts and feelings rather than. And data, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Ryan. Hi. So I stalk you on Facebook. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to know more about the thing that you're doing with Facebook. I'm sorry? What The, the, the project that you're working oh, with sure, on yeah. Facebook. Um, I, I don't understand it. It looks yeah. like you're working with a cool group of people. Yeah. Um, Facebook did a, um, uh, about a year ago, announced that they were going to put $10 million uh, into community projects, and they did this worldwide search for uh, uh, community projects and, and what they're called. It's their first class of community leadership fellows to go through like a year of uh, leadership training and seminars and working directly with, with the, the folks in Menlo Park. Um, but you have to develop a community project um, uh, to, to serve some sort of public good. Um, I applied for, for for one of the fellowships, it was like, 
I know it was like six or 7,000 uh, applicants from 142 countries, and they settled on 100. Uh, and I did my proposal you know, very specifically uh, on the addiction recovery community. Um, I'm not uh, allowed to, to talk about it yet because there's gonna be a public announcement in about three weeks of what the project is. What I will tell you uh, is it involves civic engagement. Uh, it has something to do with the, you know, the, the initiative he talked about earlier around the recovery voices vote. Uh, it has to do with um, basically going out and training people uh, what I do um, trying to create more capacity for advocates around the country and uh, connecting them digitally and, and in the real space and identifying community problems uh, that they can solve through legislation, uh, advocacy, and uh, civic engagement. And, um, you know, I know there's been a lot of slack about Facebook recently, and uh, I get that, but, um, you know, to have, have a company like Facebook lean in on this issue uh, is a big step forward and actually uh, uh, commit to invest in it too is a really big step forward too because we are lacking. One of the big uh, barriers we have is, is a lack of uh, uh, corporate philanthropy. So this is a good first step. Hi Ryan, my name is Andrea. Hi. Um, I spent many years in prison. I did state prison, federal prison. Um, got out, started using again. Life sucked. I went to Vinland, my life changed a lot. I'm now at New Way, I do sober living, and I now volunteer and give back to my community instead of taking from it. So I volunteer, I spend all my free time down in Tent City pretty much. Mm. Um, I provided 250 meals for Thanksgiving this year, and I just try to give back Fantastic. to my community. So, I would like to give you an invitation if you're not leaving too fast to come down there and maybe tour it and give you a little. Tell you what, I, 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 I'm out of here tomorrow, but I am in uh, the Twin Cities every couple of weeks. I yeah. would be happy. I, I would love to come see it. So, yes, yeah. uh, I'll take you up on that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ryan. I just want to Hi. say a couple of things and ask you a question for all of us to help support you. You have an incredible wave and quite a mu movement in the last four years, just wow, super powerful. And I think a lot of us who have been helping the addiction recovery journey uh, have been waiting for this kind of movement. And so I wanna thank you so much for your effort and your commitment, your passion about it. So um, what I'm curious about is what would you recommend that we all whether we are people who love the people who are in recovery or addicted to recovery or the people who are in recovery, what would you recommend to each one, to one of us individually? Three things that we could do to help support your movement. Mm. Good question, thank you. Uh, the, the first thing I, I would say, um, you know, if you're in recovery, I, I, just to, to give some stats here, 23 million Americans uh, living in long-term recovery in the United States, another 22 million Americans who are currently suffering who need help right now. If every person in long-term recovery would reach out to one person who is suffering, we could end this crisis overnight. So if you're in recovery, I encourage you to you know, reach your hand out and offer someone some help. Uh, if you're a family member, I, I encourage you to just love, 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 you know, love is love, you know. Um, I know they throw around this term tough love and all that stuff. And, uh, that's kind of just a contradiction in, 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 in my mind, but just, just love your loved one and be there for them. Um, you know, now moving on from that into to, to, to the impact outside of the personal recovery uh, space, uh, tell your story. Do not be afraid to go out there and tell your story. Tell, tell people who you are, uh, if you're comfortable with it. Um, you know, be honest about what's going on with you. Be honest about what's going on with your, your loved one. That's how we normalize this, right? That's how we, we get people to recognize and understand that we're everywhere, right? Like, let's come out of the shadows. Let's just show people who we are, put our cards on the table. And then the third thing is, is you know, once you're able to do that, um, get civically engaged, get politically involved. Find out where your, your politicians, where your legislators, find out where they stand on this. You know, they, they, they grandstand a lot. You know, the opioid crisis and addiction makes for a great photo op these days for politicians. Um, 
but find out what are they actually doing, right? I mean, do you have someone who's, who's out there using us as a prop and then uh, behind our backs trying to cut you know, Medicaid expansion dollars that are, that are gonna save people's lives and uh, wanting to roll back um, you know, pre-existing conditions which addiction is, and, and recovery uh, is, is covered under? Um, you know, be educated, um, vote. You know, if, if, if you, yeah, voting is so important, you know, identifying as a recovery oriented voter, which we're trying to, to build that constituency. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I pull parallels to the, to the LGBT community all the time. Um, that community came out, came out strong, identified, they organized. Some of them started running for office. Uh, you know, 1997, um, we were looking, you know, Reuters uh, was tracking gay marriage uh, since, in, since the early 90s. 1997, uh, less than 24% uh, of Americans, um, you know, thought that, that, that LGBT Americans deserved equality or, or marriage. I mean, the country was against it. It, it, it. I mean, just it was not even a question. You know, uh, a few years ago, you know, we're looking at 72%. That number's gone to 72% today. And, and a few years ago, we legalized gay marriage. It's the law of the land by the Supreme Court. That's all because that community got politically engaged, right? Um, Folks will say, yeah, but it's not, you know, and then, then the, 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 they'll, they'll, they'll come to me and say, it's not a political issue, though. You know, addiction recovery, that's not politics. You know, don't, 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 don't bring politics into this. Um, and I'm not, I do not bring politics into my personal recovery. My, my personal recovery is personal. I work a program every single day. Uh, I, you know, I keep that separate from my advocacy and, and what I do in, in work. But when you really break it down, access to health care, <laughs> you know, uh, shutting down uh, uh, private prisons, you know, uh, getting rid of that pipeline, uh, Medicaid, um, the way that we are treated, the dollars that are available for treatment, um, whether money goes to, to, to law enforcement or it goes to the public health side, those issues that ultimately affect us uh, and our personal recovery and our pathways to it and our journeys are highly political, right? So it's like... We, we've got to start looking at it from that perspective. So that, I probably gave you more than three things there now that I'm thinking, but, but, but I hope that was helpful. It was fantastic. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and I would suggest getting, you know, that, that, that it all starts local too. Um, really get involved with, I mean, we're, we're, we're creating this Recovery 2020 initiative. Uh, right now, we're getting some funding for it. We're building local groups, local teams, local capacity. Like you said, we're, we're on this mission to register and identify a million voters by 2020 because I, I can't imagine like, you know, going to a candidate. Like, I mean, look, look at the NRA. You know, look at like at National Organization for Women, the Sierra Club. I mean, they have a lot of power. They get a lot of money. They they wield a lot of influence because they've got a button they can push that sends out to a million voters. Hey, this person's good on guns, bad on guns, bad for women's health care, or you know, the environment, and people vote that way. Um, we're starting to build that machine right now. Uh, groups like the the Rumler Hope Network. Uh, you know, there's another a great group called Fed Up that that's based here locally. Um, they're our partners. They're working with us to build um, the local capacity. So get involved locally too. Get involved at the state level. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Um, my name is Alicia. I actually do intake and outreach for an organization that specializes in opioid mm -hmm. um, addiction recovery. Um, first of all, loved your book. Found myself actually asking questions within our organization, our own organization of, do we offer this? Do we have this? Let's make sure we do if we don't. So you gave me a lot of great ideas and insight, but I also found it, um, it I guess I didn't know until tonight that you had wrote, wrote this book after your, your cross country journey, which made me a little bit disappointed because I thought, gosh, you know, I really hope that he has a different point of view after he went around the country and not just um, his own personal perspective from just Florida and California. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you that at least my entire um, experience with all of these great organizations and um, treatment centers in Minnesota, I haven't seen at least any of them that I thought related to your personal story. So sure. I felt like, do you have any um, concerns or regrets that when people read your story that it's going to hinder them from treatment when they read how negative and how, how generalizing you were as a treatment um, and, and as whole. Sure. So, 
Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, so the the writing about the treatment industry and my experience with the treatment industry was not just limited to my personal experience in Florida and California. Uh, I testified for Congress uh, uh, a couple of times in the last year on the massive problems within the addiction treatment industry, uh, not just built on my experience, um, but my travels around the country, uh, my interaction uh, with different state agencies, uh, my inter interaction with the uh, American uh, uh, NATAP, National Association of uh, Treatment Providers, um, the National Alliance of Recovery Residences, um, and, and publicly you know, available information. What I will tell you is I, I, treatment saved my life. I mean, and I'm very clear about that. Treatment saved my life. Um, but the treatment system as currently stands is absolutely broken. And, and I stand by that. Um, and I think that we need massive reform uh, in the treatment industry, I, I, I strongly believe that the uh, you know ethics of treatment marketing uh, and kind of you know how you know certain providers that actually you know that there's one particular provider uh, I do not want to get sued, so I will not mention their name, but they're one of the biggest ones in the country. Uh, went in and, and uh, with venture capital and, and bought up the internet for sixty million dollars a couple years ago. Uh, and basically uh, created these these online aggregates where treatment centers could just pay, and they're they're pushing um, people to to centers based on financial incentive, not based on uh, medical need or, or an honest assessment. Um, uh, things are broken. I mean, it it, it, it is an industry uh, that is not held accountable. Uh, it's one of the only I think health uh, industries that we've a thirty five billion dollar health industry that isn't really required to measure anything. You know, and provide outcomes. Um, I, I I was just um, named actually this week to uh, a national national health or international health organization that is going to start working on uh, an outcomes report, uh, incentive based pay uh, for uh, substance use disorder treatment. I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited to bring lived experience to it. Uh, I think we need more treatment. I think we need more access to treatment. You know, but but I but I definitely stand by that 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 the system is broken. Um, I do believe there's a lot of good providers out there, a lot, and 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 I have providers, some who are some of my really good friends, and it breaks my heart to see what's happening to them. I have one in in Southern California that just had to shut their doors. They had to shut their doors because they can't compete with the marketing dollars that are being pumped in by private equity groups and treatment centers that sit on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm sorry, but there is no business. No business right now for addiction treatment providers, um, you know, to, to, to be taking these massive amounts uh, from private equity. Uh, I know that other healthcare industries do it, but what we're seeing happening is they're they're cutting down quality of care, and they are they are responsible, and they they answer to stockholders, not to patients. Um, so there's a lot, of, you know, there's a lot we can do. But but I do want to work with the treatment. I do want to work with treatment providers. Um, I think. Part of the problem, and, and I am sorry for this because I think part of the problem is they all look the same uh, from the outset right now. It is really hard to, to be able to delineate the good from the bad um, because they all kind of look the same. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, and I, and I, I, I kind of put, not, not on you, but on the industry uh, in general. When I get that question, um, it does kind of make me, you know, you know, kind of fire up inside. Because look, I'm, I'm an advocate. I'm someone who's been through the system. You know, these problems aren't just, you know, I'm not bringing anything new to the public light. This has been, you know, this is an issue that Congress has been debating. Uh, state legislators have been dealing with. We know that patient brokering is very, very real. Uh, we know that these, these marketing techniques are disgusting in some cases. I throw it back into the treatment uh, industry's court. Clean up your act. And we won't, <laughs> we won't be coming after you. Just clean up your act. You know. Thank you for being here tonight, Ryan. Thank you. My name is Michael Daub. I've been involved in the reco recovery community for about 20 years. About 20 years ago, I joined that community and had been recovered. And what they asked me to do early in recovery was get to work with others. Mm -hmm similar to what Ryan has described. I've been on the front lines. I've had two sponsees that I've lost, countless friends and others in our recovery community. 
I got involved with the Steve Rumler Hope Network, which you've heard about more than once now tonight, a number of years ago. We got Steve's law passed in 2015, went into effect, that eased the access to Knox alone. So the fact that it's sitting on a table out there is in part because that law was passed, because we got out there, up the legislature, in St. Paul, and worked to get a bill passed. In 2017, we tried to get another bill passed. It didn't succeed. In 2018, we got a bill passed in the Minnesota Senate, 60 to 6. It had broad bipartisan support. But when the bill was taken up in the House, they slammed the door in our face, and the bill never went through. We're going to be up at the legislature again this year to try to get a bill passed because it's costing the taxpayers millions of dollars to clean up this epidemic. Who created it? Big Pharma. Mm -hmm. Big Pharma's made billions of dollars on the backs of our people, our friends, our neighbors, and our families. We need to hold Big Pharma accountable. If you want to help, if you're wondering, what can I do to help, you can help us. We'll be having Opioid Day on the Hill, a rally. Now, there's two tentative dates. So January, we think it's going to, we're working on January 24th and January 30th. It hasn't been set yet. But we can let you know about that day. Give us, our, give us your email address, give us your phone number, give us your name. If Randy is still out, Randy probably, you probably know, half the people in this room probably know Randy. You can't miss him. He's got the t-shirt on that says felon. <laughs> He's just a little conspicuous. <laughs> Give him your contact information. We'll let you know. Help us. Because there's nothing better than grassroots support. Mm -hmm. There's nothing better than seeing your state, rep your state representative, your state senator, They'll, we're their constituents. They will give us their time and we can advocate to begin, to continue at least, to clean up this mess. We need your help. Come yeah. on board. Hey Ryan. Um, when you were asking about, someone up there was asking how can we help and how can we get involved. So um, I'm an advocate in LA for the recovery community. I run a family support network called Thrive Family Support. And we do a lot of partnering with Minnesota Recovery Connections. And so the answer to that question and one of the things that's coming up here on December 11th is um, they're really organizing a grassroots effort they're working with um, facing addiction. And so there is an organizational meeting on December 11th at 4.30 at Minnesota Recovery Connections offices. Um, I would really highly recommend that um, if you are wanting to get involved, um, you know, there's a lot of pockets of people doing some really good things and we need that, but there's also an effort to organize on a broader base level to get, you know, some something moving as far as just connectedness within all these little pockets of organizations that are doing good work. And so I would really recommend um, that meeting and there's a table back there for Minnesota Recovery Connections and Wendy the director here has a couple other things coming up so I'm gonna hand her the mic um, but for sure stop back at that table because they are, they really are the go-to organization for the face of recovery in the Minneapolis metro area and I'm just super honored and proud to be able to be a part of that organization so Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Hi, I'm with Minnesota Recovery Connection, Wendy Jones, and I just want to dovetail other opportunities for getting involved. We're relaunching the Recovery Advocacy Seminar, mm -hmm. which is uh, scheduled for February 22nd, and we're doing that at Metro State University. So more information to come about that, and we have uh, reserved March 4th at the Capitol for Recovery Works Day at the Capitol. So you can never have too many events yep. at the Capitol, so come to opioid 
Opioid Awareness Day, come to Recovery Works Day, come to Second Chance Day. Um, our voices need to be heard. Um, and I wanna thank you, Ryan, and also put a pitch that not only do we need uh, better treatment and more access to treatment, we need uh, more access to recovery. That's right. And, and yep. to think about treatment and yep. recovery are two different things. Yeah, and, and so I, I, I just wanna uh, Say one thing, uh, I apologize, Minnesota Recovery Connection, definitely get to them, and I'm looking forward to working with you folks too a lot more um, as they come back into the state. Treatment and recovery, good point, I didn't bring that up. I, I, it, there, if there's one thing that drives me absolutely insane, it's when I go talk to somebody and they're like, yeah, well we just appropriated $200 billion for treatment and recovery. I'm like, no, 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 you put money into treatment, you know? You didn't put money into recovery, it's treatment, and its recovery, uh, most policy folks don't know the difference. You know, exactly. so yes, recovery supports. Uh, and we should be supporting recovery right. just as much as we're supporting treatment. Uh, absolutely. So, thank you. Absolutely. One more. Okay. Okay, so uh, I am in recovery, and Hi. I just kind of wanted to give a praise report. So I'm in a program called Enhanced Treatment Program. Mm -hmm. It's out of Anoka County. Um, they origina originally started the program because women were losing their children, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, and so um, this lovely lady and this lovely lady are the facilitators, and it's a phenomenal program, but she led into it. Um, treatment is 30 days. And this is a year-long program, and they help us work through our problems, process all the shame, all the stuff that comes along with recovery, and it's changed my life. So um, I just wanted to give a little light to ETP. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, everybody. It was great to be here.